From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill coming up on today's show. Tour of Duty this morning. We get to go check it out. What should we check out? Dabo versus Mike. Folks in the know think Dabo still got it. We discuss. Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida, cptallybar.com, the website. Lunch specials Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Today's Thursday. As such, your daily lunch special for only $8.99. That's right, eight ninety nine is a cheesesteak sandwich, chicken or steak, your choice. Also comes with a side dish of your choice, straight fries, curly fries, the onion rings, the potato salad, the broccoli, all the good stuff. Pick it, choose it, can't go wrong. Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, cptallybar.com, QR code on your screen takes you right to the aforementioned website. 2475 Appalachia Parkway if you need the actual address. Warchant.com, your ultimate symbol sports source, five-star rating, review, thumbs up, likes, all that. And buckle up. You got me for a whole show again. Just kidding. Just kidding. We got we got the big dogs back. Arr, arr. Corey Clark, what's up, man? What's up, buddy? How are you doing, Aslan? I'm all, dude, gl- great to hear your voice. Great to see a text message come across my phone the other day. Hey, bro, let's do a show. Uh, I was like, for sure, let's do it. You're here. I'm here. Well, you're you're not here in Tallahassee. You're on your 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 quasi, I guess we'll call it honeymoon. How's that going, man? How's it being married to Stephanie now? Now she's really your lady. It's great. It's great. It's going great for her. I can tell you that. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're in Nashville for kind of like a mini honeymoon. The big honeymoon will be in Ireland, so we're saving all our money for that, so we can stay a few days uh, after the game. But yeah, this is like a quick jaunt up to Nashville. She'd never been here. I've been here a couple times, so. Uh, if you could tell from my voice, last night was a little rough. Yeah. I, I'll be honest with you, Aslan. The last week has been pretty rough, uh, but in a great way, um, culminating with the wedding on Saturday that I remember some of. And then, uh, yeah, and now I'm talking to you, buddy, so it's all gone well. I uh, I didn't get to listen to your uh, solo show. Well, you had Ira on yeah, earlier I was, in the week, I was just joking. I was, I was trying to put the fear of God in some people's ears before I, I unveiled oh. the, big, the big surprise. Ta-da. But did you recap, did you recap the wedding? At all? A little bit, a little bit um, by myself. And then oh, I had my Ira. mom was excited. My mom texted me and said that you, uh, she got a shout out and she was very excited about that. She did. I, w- I was pointing out, I, I was uh, uh, blending together our worlds, personal and professional, and, and mentioning how your mother uh, was glowingly speaking about the cheese curds at Corner Pocket Bar and Grill because uh, you apparently uh, made poor Sharon just hang out the Corner Pocket all weekend long while she was in <laughs> Tallahassee. Hey, man, I, I want her to see how her son lives, right? That's yeah. what we do. Uh, yeah. And she was so proud. Uh, yeah, no, we did, uh, I guess we did three straight. Well, she did two nights at Corner Pocket. We did three straight. Uh, but, yeah, cheese curds were awesome. And, uh, yeah, she – and you were a big hit, not only with my mom, but with my brother-in-law, Andy. You were a, you were a very big hit, buddy, so well done. Yeah, he's a good guy. I like him. I like him, uh, Andy. S- mm. salt, salt of the earth. Um, so – what was it like, Corey? I mean, you were dressed to the nines. You looked, you looked so great, bro. I was so proud of you. Uh, your Thanks, bride man. also. Your bride was also stunning. Eh, um, she was all right. I was thinking about this in a weird way. Uh, not weird way. I shouldn't have transitioned after I complimented your wife on her looks and said I have something weird to say because it's not going down that route. I, I promise. Okay. All right. If you guys would have gotten married like in 2018, how many people would have been at that wedding? Like, would it have been like? Like seventy five percent of who was there, I feel because I feel like I've gotten to know so many of the people that are at that wedding, like in the last year of like going to games and hanging out with you and Steph. It's just it's that magnetic sort of personality of her, just drawing everybody into her orbit, as you so eloquently stated. Well, I think I said she was like the Kool Aid Man, Uh, (laughs) but uh, but yeah, I think that uh, I would say there were probably thirty. 30 to 35 people that were there from the last couple of years. Okay. Post-COVID, I guess, I would say. And a lot of that has to do with this show. Actually, almost all of it has to do with this show and just Corner Pocket. You Mm -hmm. know, that Corner Pocket being the sponsor and then you and I doing this show and the people we've met through this show. uh, And because Stephanie is great at establishing and maintaining, I'd say it's probably about 30 or 30 to 40. Uh, it was it was more than I thought it was going to be, Aslan. I'll be honest with you. I didn't know we were going to be reaching 150 people. But, hey, man, 
That's it was awesome. all. It's awesome. That's all about her, though, right? Like she's so good at maintaining friends, and yep. and uh, you know, I, people just kind of put up with me, uh, but they love her, and that was uh, that was shown on Saturday night, buddy. Did you have a donut from the donut cake? No, and they threw them away after it was over. All just right. do- so I had some friends saw that the donuts had been thrown into the trash because they had to do something with them as we were getting ready to get on the bus at the end of the night, and so my buddy and his kid. Were like taking donuts out of the trash. I mean, they were fairly on top. They, they were. were top they were. The yeah, they were. Yeah. Th- and the way they fell into the trash can, there were several that were like above sea level, if you will. Like correct. Yeah. So they grabbed a couple and started eating them. And then one of my other friends was like, "Man, y'all are like a raccoon family." <laughs> but but still, I, I got it, man. They were donuts. I didn't get any donuts. I didn't get any of the hors d'oeuvres. Um, and that was probably one of the problems that led to a rough Sunday morning was no food. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a lot of food. But it was, hey, it was an awesome time, wasn't it? We, we wanted it to be a party. We wanted everybody to have fun, and it sure seemed like everybody had fun. Yeah, the hors d'oeuvres were awesome. Uh, the charcuterie board, as I pointed out, was like eight feet long, absolutely extravagant yeah. spread. Uh, you really know that you guys went for the moon on this one because the taco bar, the lettuce was like romaine lettuce. It wasn't, it wasn't iceberg mm-hmm. lettuce. It was that high-grade lettuce. Yeah, it was right. romaine stuff. Nothing's oh. too good for our friends, buddy. Yeah, and then I, th- I thought your guys' vows or whatever, like, I don't know, was it pre-vows? I mean, like, the, the, the things that you guys read to each other, I don't know if they were, like, yeah, whatever that was was awesome, too, man. Um, so, thanks for letting me be part I'm of it. Glad, Appreciate I'm glad it. you liked it, buddy. I'm glad, and I hope you liked the first dance. It was all it was <laughs> all for everyone. It was all yeah. for everybody's enjoyment. Yeah. All right, what's been on your mind since we last spoke then, Corey? The, the combine went down. We kind of spoke a little bit about that. Later this morning, we've got tour of duty. Oh, observation. That's right. I yeah, know you, you got to get up at when. When are you getting up for that? Uh, so I usually it's like hour fifteen before I have to report to duty somewhere. That lets me. Mm. I don't hit snooze. I wake up. I just commiserate, and then I get out of bed, make my bed, make breakfast, and then drive to campus and try to find parking. But it, it shouldn't be that bad to find parking at five forty-five no. on campus. So I think we'll be fine there. So I'll, I'll probably cheat and just do an hour. I'll probably set the alarm for five o'clock as your folks are listening to this. I probably was up at five o'clock oh in the morning gosh, today. Wow. That's fine. Hey man, you know, everyone needs heroes. Hey, well, good luck, man. I'll be, I'll be thinking about you. Who are you going to be wishing you were out there watching me? I'm just looking at the list. Obviously just so many new guys, uh, part of the, the Noel family, Sean Murphy, Devonte Brown, uh, Sione Lola Hea, Tommy Wadarojaye, Richie Leonard, Roy Dell Williams, Malik Benson, Terrence Ferguson, TJ, um, who are some of these guys uh, that you, you wish you could see? Grady Kelly, uh, obviously Jalen Lucas, Earl Little Jr., Jalen Brown, DJ, Marvin Jones mm-hmm. Jr. Yeah. Um, very, very uh, pronounced list of, of stars in the making that we hope. Uh, who are, Who's the first person you're going to want to scrub to the video and check out, or who's going to put in the group text to Ira and I? Like, how did X look? Yeah, I don't know that I will because they're not doing football stuff. They're doing right. like uh, tour of duty, so it's training and it's you know running around cones and running around uh, hula hoops. Uh, but what what I think you can tell, so all those m- names you mentioned, don't really care about the running backs and don't care about the receivers because I assume they're all going to be athletically gifted and be impressive. I want to see, and it takes me back to maybe the biggest star of the combine for Florida State, Fisk, mm. and like we knew there was something in there. Before he even started practicing because he could beat Mike Norvell in a race. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you could see somebody that's about 300 pounds running and moving that fast. You're like, well, that probably translates pretty well to the football field. So, all of the linemen you just named. I, w- I would be interested if I was there, but I'm not there. So, hey, I'll be sleeping. But I would be interested to see how they moved. Marvin Jones, the kid from Oregon State, the kid from West Virginia. I want to see how they move, how quick they are, how fast they are. That w- that's what I'd be interested in because I know the running backs and receivers are all going to be impressive. What do the linemen look like? How do they move? And can they stand out even in a non-football drill athletically like Braden Fist did uh, last year? I'm glad you, you brought up Braden and spoke about what you saw from him last year because I was, I was trying to think back on it last year. Like, Do you remember like what you took away? Like, Did you have the sense – of how, I don't want to say special, but at least how talented and how successful that team could have been last year by watching them in shorts and t-shirts for like an hour and a half at the crack of dawn. No, no. And it really didn't because you didn't have, you didn't have Braden last spring, right? He didn't practice. He, He sprinted against Norvell, but he wasn't doing any of the work. And then you didn't have Keon. So really the two biggest additions to the team that were 
team changers. Uh, maybe they go, maybe they still go undefeated without those two guys, but I don't I don't know, man. I don't know you beat Louisville without um, yeah. Braden Fisk, Unlikely. and I sure don't think you beat Clemson without Keon. Um, so the, those two guys doing what they – they weren't there to see, so no. But I, I think – so there's nothing you can see in shorts, and there's nothing that gave me a thought that they were going to be 13-0 and just from what you see at tour of duty, but I was going to translate that to even spring. Like, there was nothing we saw in spring that was an automatic, this team's going to be great. Like, Kentron was their best receiver. Um, the running well, backs, you Johnny, know, spring. Johnny, Johnny, so, Johnny Tron was the second best receiver. You know, he still felt really no, good No, I mean, Johnny. in the spring because Johnny didn't go all the time. Okay. okay. You know what I mean? Like, right, Johnny right. took days off or didn't practice all the time. For the guy that was there the whole time, it was Kentron. He, you thought he was going to be the number two. And it turned out he barely played um, because of an injury and because Keon came. So, yeah, I don't – I'm – but it, it just it reminds me, man, how excited I am about this spring. Like it's it's even different. It's it's more it's different than last year. It's just more names, more bodies, and then you're like, okay, well, if they were so good in the portal last year, and they hit on a Braden Fist. Now I know everybody wanted Keon, but they hit on a Braden Fist, Jaheem, these kind of guys. Like, what are these guys that don't have any real tape at the college level, or any uh, a lot a lot of them don't have a lot of production. I'm really, really interested in what they look like come, what are we, what are we two weeks away from spring practice, Just right? Just about, Just yeah. Just about. Yeah, yeah that's – and and then you start doing the math because, you know, they. I know there was a lot of talk, and I assume you and Ira talked about it on, on the show on Monday. But, you know, that was an incredible performance at the Combine. Like, they did great. All, almost all of them that were there. Uh, Johnny posting a four five two is nuts. <laughs> like that, I think I feel like my man made him some money yeah. posting a posting a four five two. And then obviously we know the, what Braden did and Deloach and and Jari and Jones. But I think there's a chance they could have that many guys there next year, right? Like, couldn't you be in the tens or twelves at the combine next year? I just don't know if like I probably, but like I don't I don't think Pat's going to test like Jared. I don't think Farmer or Jackson is going to no, test I like just Fisk. Mean, but like still it, though, yeah. It pro- Probably not, but like the the point being, like all these guys that have done nothing really are have accomplished so little at the college level. Not the guy at Oregon State. Can't tell me his name again. Sione Lola Hea. Okay, C- Lola Hea. Yeah, sorry guys, sorry. I'm still in a wedding fog. I've a got fog the list, and I've got bliss. the I've got the list right in front of my face, so it's easier for me to. I'm not like you folks so at home that know everything inside and out. But I think he's going to be he's going to be a combine invitee. I want to oh, see yeah. what he looks like. If yeah. Marvin Jones has a good year, he could go to the combine. Shaheem's going to the combine. Uh, Azaria, you think if he bolts early, which mm. he very well could as a combine guy, all the offensive linemen, some of them are coming, are, are going to Indianapolis. Like it's just when you, but DJ, so many of these DJ guys, probably too. yeah, of course, DJ's yeah. going. Malik, if he has a good year, is going. Um, Roy the, L, the running maybe? back is probably a is probably a combine invite. So you get an invitee. So you see all these guys like it, it, you you've got future potential NFL players joining your program that we have never seen before, and that's what's co- so exciting about uh, th- this spring practice coming up. And it just bodes well. Would you? I mean, I just wouldn't be surprised, man, if they had another twelve there. I mean, a couple of the receivers might. Uh, Morlock. DJ, of course, Toa Feely, I think, is a combine invite, probably. And then you you still have dudes on defense in the secondary with Fentrell and Azarie and, and Shaheem. And then defensive linemen. You know, you got these defensive ends coming in, Patrick Payton. These guys are all juniors. They could come back for another year, or some of them are juniors. But, you know, some of them might just be here for a year. Um, it'll, and it'll just be interesting to see what they look like in the spring because there's a chance they could be uh, another 12 or 13 combine guys on this team again this year coming up. So how about quality versus quantity? Or I guess at that certain point, I mean, if you've got 12 guys going to the combine, you're, yeah. you're good. That's what I'm no saying, right? What. That's what gives you hope. Yeah. It wouldn't be outlandish, right? For the kid at West Virginia, the kid from West Virginia, uh, Lola Haya. What is it? Golly. Yeah, you, now you hit it. You were good. You were good. Oh, trust, nailed it. Okay. trust yourself. Yeah. You know, you know, DJ is going to be one. I uh, is going to be a combine invite. And then more like you, when you start naming the names that, they're going to be experienced again. They lost a lot of talent. We know that. They lost a lot of talent. And so far, none of these guys have done anything. Uh, well, the guys coming in the portal have done nothing in a Florida State uniform. But if they're as good as they're projected to be, or in some cases, like Lola Hea, the kid at Oregon State, if he's just as good as he was, those are NFL caliber players. So, again, you've got a, you've got a – it's not a machine quite yet. It's not Georgia. It's not Alabama with Saban. 
but it just looks like you're going to have another really experienced with NFL caliber players all across your football team. You might take a step step down athletically or a step down talent wise. Mm-hmm. Jared, the the step down from Jared Burse to Marvin Jones. I don't I don't know what it is, but it's going to be a step down, right? But it might be a smaller step than we think. That's what we get to see in the spring. That's what's so exciting about it. Yeah, you know, looking at it from so this past year here, um, you know, Michigan had 18, Washington had 13, Florida State had 12, Texas had 11, Georgia had 11, Bama, Penn State, 10 a, 10 a pop. Right. So it's like, I mean, you know, Michigan national champion, Washington runner up, Texas semifinalists, Georgia should have been semifinalist. Alabama lost to the national t- champions in overtime. Uh, but Penn State is Penn State. So that, that's just good company to keep. So I guess, yeah, that, that's right. my thing. I was, I've been afraid that, like, I don't think the quality is going to quite be what it was this past year. But when you got that many guys that are still talented, you're probably going to be all right, especially when you're going from four teams to 12 teams. So that's probably the way to look at it. And don't we think they're well coached? Hmm. Like that helps too, right? That you have a really good coaching staff, and I and I think we do think that. And they have a good. Uh, what did my man Derek Ray? He won some award on Wednesday. Oh yeah, he was like the uh, football scoop GM of the year or something uh, for what he did with the. Uh, he's he's for y'all that don't know. I, I don't personnel know director title. of the year. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Person. I, so he's the Florida State personnel director. Correct. Uh, yeah. But I mean, look, man. He he lives in the portal. That's that's kind of his job, and he. Did a bang up job this past year, and it looks like they he's put enough pieces in place on this team, where again, no, they might not be thirteen and zero. DJ is not as good as Jordan Travis. Your top two receivers won't be Keon and Johnny, but the overall mix of rece- uh, talent at wide receiver, you you could it's going to be a different looking thing, right? Like mm-hmm. what Keon run a four or six, and Johnny ran a four or five two. Not slow, especially for their size. Uh, may, I'm sure Keon would have liked to run faster, but you know he's four, he's six four and a half. So those guys don't run. A lot of them don't run four four ones. But you're going to be faster at wide receiver this year. You're probably going to make more plays downfield, um, and that that's exciting too. It's just going to be it's going to look like a different offense. But th- there's nothing there's nothing that says Malik Benson can't have a breakout year and then be a combine invite. E. Mm. Uh, so that's uh, so that's what's again. I just keep going back to that. That combine, in a weird way, Aslan. I don't know why, but the way they play, the way they performed at the combine, kind of got me fired up again for this team. Even though all those guys are gone, yeah. it's like I don't know, man. I did Jarian Jones ever strike you as an incredible athlete? Not a guy that was going to jump nearly forty inches in his vertical and have a, a sub four four forty. I didn't. I didn't think he had that level pedigree. No. So it's like I know. I know he's gone, but it's like. Will they be able to find a uh, you know a reasonable facsimile of that? I think they can probably. Maybe Earl Little is that guy. Yeah. Like you know what I mean? Like it, it just feels like the whole the the floor has been raised so much that somebody like that that Jari and Jones, you have a few of those now on the team. And I'm not saying you have guys that are going to be playing nickel. I'm just saying dudes that are are pretty good college football players that were contributors. But we look at it, we're, so, we're in a vacuum, right? We're so close to it. But when we take a 10,000 step, uh, foot step back, you're like, man, that's a really talented football team that we covered. Mm. Jari and Jones, was kind, he wasn't an afterthought, but he was like a part-time starter. And he's going to be an NFL draft pick. Is that where Florida State is now, where guys that aren't stars are still going to be picked in the third, fourth, and fifth rounds like the old days? Because that's what it looks like to me is happening here, where guys that are just kind of, uh, you know, you think they might be pretty decent players, they might be pretty good athletes, and then you have Kalen Deloach, who I always thought was a pretty good athlete, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he was he is he the fastest linebacker in the country? I think it was One second, or was that first yeah. or second? It slips my mind. I yeah. mean, that's crazy, right? Yeah. And then Jarian Jones, I always thought he's a pretty good athlete, good player. One of the fastest DBs in the country. He wasn't even one of the four best DBs on the team. Again, that's a cool place to be, right? That's all I'm saying. I'm trying to see here. I got the, the top 40 pulled up um, on the list here. I'm trying to see where some of these guys Oh, from go. back in uh, the summer? Yeah. Jarring was 30th on the composite. Yeah, right? Yeah. That's crazy. And I don't think we were crazy. For, I don't think that's uh, – we were nuts for having them that low. Yeah. 
because he I mean I always thought he was a he I always kind of thought he was like just a veteran presence not incredible athletically but knew where he was supposed to be kept getting better a very mature voice um, in the locker room just a, a mature dude because he had been in college football for so long but he never struck me as this freak out and they had a lot of them and I think they still do which is the good news yeah I do wonder Trey once... Benson too by the way yeah Trey, that's a number super that's fast. a nice number to throw out there yeah. so Keon runs four six one officially I would be shocked if he doesn't run a full a full tenth of a second faster at pro day I think he'll I yeah. think he'll be low four fives I, don't know, I feel like I don't know man he ran so fast in that gauntlet drill I mean literally was the fastest guy he ran over 20 miles an hour that like all he needs to do for the next however many days it's what the the seventh as you folks listen to this and then pro days the 22nd like for the next two weeks man just work on on your your get off right I guess just work on yeah. your get off and the, the first 10 yards and then everything else will probably fall in place and, and you'll be fine it was just like seeing like the the because he ran four six four I think on his first try and you're just like hey uh, yeah. but then you know the way he finished on that gauntlet drill and you think about what he can do at pro day. Uh, makes you think that he'll be all right. It's all going to work out. He's also and he's a gamer, right, man? Like I, I would, I, I leave it to some of these teams to go pick a guy that ran a four four three, but ne- not nearly the athlete or production of Keon Coleman. But they're scared off by a tenth of a second in the forty, um, and not take the guy that is a freak and a, and a really really good football player and made a bunch of crazy catches. Like the the the, the te- like if he'd have run a four eight, you'd have some real thinking to do. A four six plays right. Like it's not. You watch the NFL. How many guys are just running by dudes ever? Right. The the DBs are all as fast or faster. So he wasn't ever going to be as fast as Jari and Jones, or people like that. Um, so, but but it's about uh, the ability to get separation and it's the ability to go up and make catches. And he certainly can go do that, just like Johnny can. Um, so the speed was never going to be, um, you know, one of his calling cards it was it wasn't going to be what he was known for his strengths but as long as he can show he's not uh, as you know he's faster than Brayden Fisk uh, then he's then he's uh you know I think I think you're right anything in the four fives anything around I mean four six will play in the NFL I just I know it will uh, but he's also going to get faster probably as he gets older you know he's going to develop more and he's going to become a but he's never going to be a guy that just runs a 70 yards past someone he's just not that dude he's not Randy Moss I don't know, people is. people bring up Anquan, but like I just I feel like I feel like Keon did rely on his athleticism, not just so much like circus catches, but like I I feel like he did rely on on field speed to to get separation and get past guys. I mean, a little bit more than most receivers in the country. So like if he was actually able to do that on the field, that probably should supersede what he put on tape in Indianapolis. But maybe. You know, what he put in Indianapolis carries more weight in some corners of some NFL rooms about who they want to take. And I just wonder where he'll fall right now because, you know, I think Marvin Harrison Jr., despite doing nothing, remains the number one receiver. I think Odunze has probably cemented himself as a number two guy. I think if you're a floor safe fan. Did he fan, run? You, did Odunze run? I'm pretty sure he did. I'll pull it up. Um, okay. I think if you're a floor safe fan, you're you're telling yourself that your guy is better than a dude from the, from the Pac-12. I just don't think that's the way it worked out in the combine with the Dunes, the way that people were speaking about him afterwards. Oh, no. I don't. I hope Florida State fans aren't saying that. That's still, That guy's awesome. Yeah. And uh, tested well. He ran 4.45, four, had a 39-inch vertical. Um, yeah. So that's at 6'3". And all the production. Tall. Right. And all right. the production. Yeah, Keon isn't Ke- – you, you say that. Keon didn't make a lot of huge plays down the field where he was just running by people. He was leaping over people. Um, yeah, but he wasn't was a possession strength. guy like Anquan. Like he wasn't doing seven yard square ins and then you know shedding a tackle and going nuts. You know, like it was stuff yeah. outside the numbers mostly. You know, well he was, but he was. Yeah, you're right. And he was. Uh, he's like, uh, well, he's like a Anquan was like a battering ram. Uh, Keon's more smooth and silky, I guess, than Anquan was. He, I mean, if he has anywhere close to the career of Anquan Bolden, he'll be very, he'll have a great career and have a lot of money. Because Anquan was awesome, an awesome, awesome football player. But yeah, I think they're different. I think that what people are trying to compare is the speed. But you're right, yes, Keon is yes, the speed. Keon uses his athleticism more than I don't. I don't say he uses his speed. He uses his athleticism. That frame, being that quick, being to get by people, better than maybe Anquan did. But Anquan could just bully people. He played kind of bully ball at wide receiver, and was just so strong people would bounce off him. 
Um, so you couldn't get close to him because if you got close to him and he gave you a little shiver with the arm, you flew backwards because he was so darn strong. He's kind of like T.O. in that way, hmm. uh, just like a smaller version of T.O. So, uh, yeah, look, I, I think Keon, I think you're going to look at, I mean, if we want to, I mean, I know we got five weeks until the draft, six weeks until the draft, but, uh, I mean, I think Keon is certainly no worse than a second rounder. Um I, he could be late first, but I think we thought that anyway, somewhere in the late first round. I think Verse is a first rounder. I think he yes. locked that up. Yes. And I think Fisk could sneak into the dang first round. I mean, there's going to be somebody. I heard Jeff talking about this yesterday. Cameron, the great Jeff Cameron mm. from Warchant, um, saying there will be somebody that's picking like 27th that's like, man, we really like Braden Fisk, but is he going to be around when we get to draft again? Like, if we like him, let's just take him now, even though it might be a reach because he doesn't have a first-round grade. He's supposed to be middle of the second round, but we won't get to get him then. Yeah. It, so that could happen. It takes one team. But I think Braden Fist, with that production he showed, especially at the end of the year, and the the freakish athleticism, really genuinely freakish for that size, he might be a first-rounder. So you might have two first-rounders. And I think, you know, Jarian, Johnny, Jaheim, Trey, Renardo, I think all those are absolute draft picks, right? Yeah. And then I don't know who you – I mean, so you're looking at at least eight, maybe ten. Somebody might somebody might take Deloach, Bethune. Um, I'm sure there's another one out there that I'm forgetting. Well, Fab- uh, So, yeah, man. So, they, they had 12 guys out there, three really – Fabian, Tatum, and, and Jordan really didn't test. I think Tatum did the bench press. I don't think Fabian did anything. Um, no, Fabian did stuff. I saw him. And he did – I saw his name for, like, the fastest – 10 yard split in the 40 or something. He he was somewhere up there with the defensive tackles testing where he was one of the top names. But I don't remember what the drill was exactly because, you know, I wasn't paying that close attention to it. I was having to get ready for a wedding, everyone. Yeah. But I thought I saw Fabian's name somewhere um, in the in the um, in the leaders in one of those cat one of those uh, stats. I know he's got really big paws. He's got really big hands. Yeah. You measured out it, but yeah, I can't on the NFL Combine profile for him. It doesn't have him listed. Um, for having done like the uh, the oh, forty to weird. then do the split or whatever. So, um, but yeah, um, they've got guys that are going to get drafted. Uh, on Keon, real quick here. Uh, two hundred fifty seven of his re- of his receiving yards this year came on routes in which he ran twenty or more yards. One hundred eighteen yards on routes of ten to nineteen. Okay, um, but he had a bunch on short routes. So. Uh, Routes of, you know, from the zero to nine yards, he had 212 yards of his receiving came from those shorter inter. That's not intermediate. That's just short. That's just that's Mike Norvell. So you're talking about like the one of the what? Remember the one of the touchdowns he had against Wake, where it was just simply a quick throw to him, and he caught it at the line of scrimmage and just shoved the dude off him and ran into the end zone. Yeah, that counts as a zero to nine. Yeah, because that's the depth of his route. That's the depth of the route. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, he had a few of those. They they threw a lot of they threw some short stuff to him too. Yeah, and remember, man, it ain't normal. It just like we get so bogged down sometimes, and I do this too. And we just talked about it for ten minutes. We get so bogged down with these numbers, these testing numbers, and like I don't know, is that will that athleticism play? Is he fast enough, or can he do this or that? And it's like, man. He was a six four and a half wide receiver, former basketball player at Michigan State, playing for Tom Izzo. Did also return punts, and did it well. Mm. Like made people miss in space. How many six four dudes are returning punts? So that is a that is an athleticism that is not normal. And so what happens is we look at these forties, and we're like, well, maybe he's not that good an athlete. You know, look at all these receivers that run faster than him. And it's like, yeah, man, but. They're not as tall as him. They don't leap like he does, and they're not they they're not returning punts at six four and a half, making all these dudes miss. That's or six four, whatever he's listed at, like he's right at six four. Like that's not normal. Most punt return there aren't many punt returns in the country that are six four. So I think that is a that is a level of athleticism that is elite, even yeah, if his speed is an elite. No, I, I'm not debating whether or not he's a. Oh, I, was, I wasn't talking about you. I, w- I was talking about just the way other people, the way we all sometimes put too much stock into into 40 times. I, it, yeah. And we lose sight of, golly, man, are you telling me there's that many players better than Keon F. and Coleman? No. I don't know. I don't know about that. I just wonder again, like in this class, if you're the, if you're the fourth best receiver in this class, like let's just say that 
Harrison Jr., Odunze, and Neighbors are ahead of of Keon. Um, you you I mean in the, in twenty twenty four and you're the fourth best receiver. I mean there's a there's a decent chance you still go first round. Um, oh yeah, I think so. I think there'll be f- yeah. I, I bet there'll be five or six first. Aren't in there? Aren't there usually four or five or six first rounder well, wide receivers taking the first round these days? Don't have that data in front of me, but that sounds about right. I know. I was we'll just saying. It. I think just anecdotal anecdotally, I feel like that's uh that seems like a normal number about five in the first round every year. Yeah. So yeah, that's all. I, was, I just I wonder how you know. Again, man, if, if you're in a four four nine or whatever, which is it's stupid. I get it. It's stupid. Like just the. Tenth of a second and change, but it just, you know, shout out to Jared Verse. Like, Jared Verse ran like a four, six something on his first one. And Daniel Jeremiah even joked, like, I don't know why he's doing the second one. He must want to get sub four, six. And he ran like a four, five, nine. And then him and Rich Eisen laughed about it, but like, yeah, just how much better that looks and sounds like. Just that, that one hundredth of a second to go from 4.6 flat to 4.59. Uh, and that just gets you buzzed about, but you know the the buzz dies down after a week or so, and uh, we've kind of hit that that point of it. But yeah, and the thing about Verse, man, is we knew he we knew he had the production, we knew he had the size, he, we knew he was probably going to be a first round pick anyway. But he all all Indianapolis did for him was confirm it. Oh yeah. Like yep, yeah, he's as good athlete as you thought he was. He's as strong as you thought he was, and is he he's uh, as dynamic as as you thought he was like that the four. At that size, to run a four-five-nine or a four-six flat is uh, really, really impressive, and that'll play. And so it's like if you have any of these lingering doubts, like is he really that explosive? Is he? You know, I see what I see on film, but I just want to know quite how. I, I want to be able to compare him to someone. What is his explosiveness like? What is his speed like? What is his ten, whatever his ten-yard burst like? And yeah, they all play at an elite NFL level. So anybody that was on the fence about whether he was, and I don't know why they would have been, but if they were on the fence about it, he knocked them off the fence with that performance, just like Fist did, just like Jarian did. Quite frankly, I, I'm going to be fascinated with Johnny Wilson. And we'll mm. leave it at that. We'll stop with the combine talk. But I, I'm going to be fascinated what he played himself into with a 4-5-2, yeah. like at that size. Um, is uh, Yeah, it'll be – it'll and the production that he had for two years. What, what, what that ends up looking like come April – 25th and 26th but man it's gonna be a fun draft again mm. Aslan. i know right it's gonna, we're gonna be paying attention all three days we should have been in indianapolis probably you know probably I mean, you know next year yeah it's fine it's fine next yeah. year i won't be getting married <laughs> you, would you have wanted to be there to watch not really you know I mean? not really watch, and there's know. nothing that we would have added that really would have brought value to your folks subscription i mean uh you know my interviews on video would have been a little bit better quality than some of the stuff that was shot on a phone. But you know, is that right. enough to spend two thousand dollars on me going up there for five days and or miss whatever? and miss your co-host's wedding and not get to hang out with Sharon Clark, you know, and the rest of the right. Clark family Correct. and Brady Clark and Brady. My gosh, man, <laughs> just kids a stud, Corey. Well done, man. <laughs> Let's calm it down. He hey he had a good time with Eva's friends. Eva's uh, Stephanie's daughter, and she yeah. brought some, uh, uh, you know. Whatever, friends, contemporaries, teenage friends, yeah. contemporaries, and uh, yeah. Brady had a good time with them. So that was that was all good, and they got to see their dad make a fool out of himself. Well, more nah. importantly, they got to see his dad's friends make a fool out of himself singing that song to him. Uh, Did you remember that song, by the way? Absolutely. Come on, man. Aaron Neville. Okay, Come Just on. Just want to make sure. Yeah, Aaron Neville, Linda Ronstadt, baby. Can't can't go can't can't go wrong with those two. Didn't he sing a song or two on the uh, Bird on a Wire uh, soundtrack with Mel Gibson <laughs> and Goldie Hawn? You. I don't know, but I bet there's no way you just made that up. Like that wouldn't just be something you misremembered. So uh-huh. I a hundred percent think he did ask a lot. I believe in you. All right. He also, Jason, the buddy who did the Aaron Neville part, he also had a really big mole he was going to put on his head <laughs> and then decided not to. It's like, nope, nobody will be able to see it anyway. Uh-huh. So he didn't put it on there. Oh, it was incredible. Um, yeah. So what's going to happen? Are you going to send me, am I going to wake up one day to a, an email with, like 934 videos and photos and you and Stephanie be like, Hey, if you get a minute, can you just make like some sort of highlight video for us today? Thanks. Bye. You know what, uh, what Stephanie's idea was, uh, was she was going to send it to Iris daughter, Alexa, who does that kind of stuff Hmm. and does it well and would pay her for it. Oh, okay. Um, little, little money. She's a Florida state student. She's a, she's really a screenwriter. 
Uh, but she also does editing and, and video stuff. We've seen her. She does a really good job. So we might, because trust me, we got a lot of crazy videos coming in. A lot of me dancing, hmm. uh, the, the the first dance, the song. I don't know if anybody recorded the vows. But anyway, we, uh, well, yes, if she says no, we will pay you to do it. We okay. would love you to do it, buddy. All right. Let me know. I'm around. Uh, back know. to the combine real quick. There's uh, no way to confirm nor deny that vitamin energy might have been coursing through the veins of some of these guys when they were breaking records out there in Indianapolis. Just saying, just saying. Um, if they were, they probably took the Vitamin Energy Workout Plus because it's energized with seven plus hours of energy, packed with vitamins, and tastes great. It's energy and it's performance, and the sour apple flavor is just delightful on the palate. Two hundred sixty milligrams of all natural caffeine. Got a little L-citrulline in there, a little beta alanine, a little arginine, a little carnitine. Get the pump going. Helps burn fat a little bit better in some studies. The one study that you need to know about, though, is that vitamin energy is clinically proven to boost your workouts, your energy level, reduce brain fog, and improve your focus. It's on the label. It was tested. I actually have the abstract. It's like 15 pages long. I've read through it. I've poured through it. I wouldn't lie to you folks. Go to vitaminenergy.com. Promo code is WARCHAMPBOGO, WARCHAMP, B-O-G-O. You buy one item, you get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. The variety packs, oh yeah, you can get one of those free as well. Try them all, different flavors, different varieties. Can't go wrong. Shaking and take it. Vitamenergy.com. Promo code Corey. Or Champ Bogo. Crushed it. Shaking and take it. I'm going to sprinkle a little baseball towards the end of the show uh, as they get done playing against Florida Gulf Coast last night, putting the show here. Uh, Hoops uh, lost to Pitt on Tuesday night up there in Pittsburgh in the Steel City, Iron City. Uh, after I had good things to say about Florida State and how I felt they could be moving forward, maybe not just this year, but next year, they've they've gone ahead and lost two games and to not the best teams in the conference. Although Pitt's pretty solid, right. but Georgia Tech wasn't a that was a quality that was a tier or quad three loss probably. Um, were you able to watch the game on Tuesday? Night? Did you take anything away from the latest uh, performance from the men's basketball team? No, I was not able to watch, uh, and I'm, I guess sounds like it was a good thing. Uh, no, there, there's really not much to say about it, um, which is funny because you asked me if, what I wanted to talk about, and I was like, well, let's talk about basketball, and then I immediately say there's not much to say. But, uh, you know, I, there's nothing new. This is nothing new. They can't shoot. They don't defend well. They don't rebound well, although they rebounded okay that night because Pitt made everything. They didn't give up a lot of offensive rebounds because Pitt made everything they shot. Um, and so – Again, when you look again, they don't that these last two games have been the worst games to me uh, because they weren't against good teams. I mean, they weren't against great teams. Pitt's pretty good. Georgia Tech's eh, and you just got worked. There were stretches where you just got absolutely worked, um, and you, you didn't stop them. They both scored a bunch of points. Your defense isn't very good, and when is it going to get better next year? You, you you think they're going to add shooting, which is great, but, I mean, again, it's like, what, what are they going to look like defensively? Are they going to be any better defensively? Um, are they just going to keep giving up 75 to 90 points every game? Um, which, I mean, they play a fast style, so they're going to give up points. You can't just judge defense just on points, but their field goal percentage defense is horrible. They don't make threes. They're one of the worst rebounding teams in the country. There's a lot of things you don't like about them that you wonder – is it going to get better? Like, Baba, man, are you going to get bigger and stronger? Uh, Corin, are you going to be able to – Corin's had some nice games here lately. Really nice games against Pitt, yeah. Yeah, offensively. Mm. But are you going to be better defensively? Because, you know, they, they he gets exploited because of the way they play defense. He, he gets exploited some. But anyway, we don't have to go into all that. They, they made a step. They're not great. They're average. Last year they were, let's just, they were below average, right, Aslan? I think that's fair. Right yeah. to call them below average last year, they had yeah. the worst season of program history. So this year they're average. They're going to finish either 15 and 16 or 16 and 15, depending on what they do against Miami on Saturday. And you know they're just a okay, uh, just just an okay team. Nothing nothing special. I just don't like that the last two games were probably their least competitive mm -hmm. of the whole ACC season. Didn't really have a chance in the second half against either one of those teams, which isn't great coming down the stretch. But what are you going to do? They finish up the season, uh, regular season, that is, at home against Miami Saturday at 4 o'clock. Uh, they are currently the 10th seed as things sit right now in the ACC. If the season ended right now, they would play Louisville, though, who is the, the 15th and final there we go. seed. Uh, they would play them at 
4.30 in Game 2 on Tuesday, March 12th in the uh, ACC tournament. But there's still going to be some moving and shaking going on probably here. Uh, they're 9-10 and 10 right now in conference. They're tied with NC State and Virginia Tech. So, yeah. and I mean, so I mean, they, they they theoretically could, if they beat Miami and get some help, they could have a first round bye. Um, I think that, that's but for what to what yeah. end? Right? Yeah. Are they going to win yeah. the ACC tournament? No, they don't. Yeah. They don't guard well enough or shoot well enough to to win three or four straight days against teams like that. So, it, they're limping to the finish line. I would hope it'd be more of a sprint, but it seems like that five game stretch in January was the anomaly, not the reality. Um, they played well for five straight games. I mean, they played pretty well for 10 or 12. They won five in a row, and you thought, okay, maybe there's something here. And it's like, eh, no, nah, they're just they're just average. They're just average. And, you know, again, we've talked about it. We'll talk about it more. I don't think Leonard's going to be out of a job. But there isn't a lot of hope going into next year that it's going to be appreciably better. But it should be a little bit better if they can add some shooting. And get tougher, man. Just get tougher. Get guys that can rebound. Out rebound teams. That's fun to do. So hopefully that hopefully they address some roster concerns of which they have plenty. Look at those minutes that those starters are playing. That's not a Leonard Hamilton type team where like the starters play thirty minutes. But he does that with this team because the bench isn't very good. So he's got to they've got to f- figure out a way if they can in the world of NIL to make that roster better and more competitive, especially the the second half of it. Has nothing to do with what you just talked about because uh, I just saw it come across a Twitter feed. It's been out there for a while, but then it's, you know, it's, I guess it's behind, it's come out from the paywall of, of the athletic. You know, we talked about you feel good about Florida State's chances football wise moving into the future because of their coach. Um, man, I just uh, try to find the proper way to phrase this thing. If, if you're a Clemson fan, how confident are you that Dabo's a better coach than Mike Norvell? Like, put yourself in the shoes of Clemson. Fan, not rabid Clemson fan, but like the Aslan variety of a Clemson fan who's like pretty level headed, probably. Yeah, I don't think you're very confident. No. I think you're worried. Um, you know, they he caught up when you think about those two programs in 2020 and what that team would have done to Florida State if they had played. Um, it's a you know, it's a 50 60 point win. Mike Norvell caught up really quick, really quick. Um, the next year they lost by what of essentially a field goal, hmm. and then two years later they beat them. This year they're going to be ranked higher than them. They finished thirteen and zero in the regular season. So, yeah. And look, man, if if they were still coaching the same sport as the sport was in twenty 2020 twenty or twenty nineteen, I think your Clemson fan you'd be like, yeah, man, I got no worries. Yeah. Dabo's going to load this roster. He's going to recruit his tail off. But it's not the same sport. And one guy is excelling at a huge portion of the sport, which is the portal, and the other guy doesn't believe in it. So, no, I would be very worried. Even the rational Clemson fans, not not Tyler from Spartanburg, <laughs> but the rational guys are going to be worried that Florida State's got themselves a really good one. Are there nine head coaches at the Division One FBS level that are better than Mike Norvell, you think? I don't know, but are there ones that are proven to be better? No. The, Kirby has proven to be better. Mm-hmm. Um, One. Who else? Dabo's two. Okay, now this is Bruce Feldman's list. It's not the okay. athletic. It's it's one man who knows a lot about the game because he's got good contacts. Kirby one, Dabo two. Bruce's guy out in Lawrence, Kansas. Lance Leipold oh, okay. three. Yeah. Kalen DeBoer four. Ryan Day five. Brian Kelly six. All right. Which I kind of get, but I was like, hey, man, that's two years in a row head-to-head. James Franklin, seven. Don't get that. Kyle Winningham at Utah, eight. Lincoln Riley, nine. Mike Norvell, ten. Yeah, I think the thing with Norvell is back it up with another good year this year. And, like, not that this list matters at all, um, but back it up again with another 10-ish, 11-ish win season again this year after losing all that talent. And then, yeah, now all of a sudden you're in the top three to five. Like, and nobody would blink an eye. Like, look, man, you, yeah, I get it. Dabo has accomplished so much more than Norvell. It's, I, I mean, it's not even close when you're talking about career accomplishments. But if you're asking any of those programs, would they be horrified? Or, like, would Penn State fans rather have Norvell or James Franklin? Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know that Clemson fans, as you were alluding to, would they rather have – Dabo right now in 2024 are Mike Norvell. Again, 
Mike Norvell's not a he's not a proven commodity like Dabo is. He doesn't have championships in the trophy case like Dabo does. So I get it. It might sound outlandish, but look where the pro, look where this program has gone in such a short amount of time. Look how Clemson's like starting to head downhill, and it would be. I mean, I think you're. I don't think it's just a homerism on our part to say that Clemson fans would not be upset at all if they traded head coaches. Yeah. And I think you could probably say that for every coach on that list, except for the guy in Athens. Like, I'll be honest with you, we know for sure Alabama wanted Norvell more than they wanted DeBoer. Well, we don't know so, for sure, but we have a we, we feel that's probably the case. We have a very good I there was another story that came out again. Oh, from Chris Lowe. Um, a cup. Uh, I read yeah, I read our show fell on warchant.com person. I take that as Oh, there you go. Sorry, buddy. That's right. Good call. Um so uh so yeah, so I just think that's not outlandish. It might sound outlandish cuz 2 years ago he was 5 and 7. And the year before that he was 3 and 6. It's been essentially two good years. But man, we all see what he did and how he runs a program. And it it tracks as if it's going to – this seems like a sustainable way to coach. And it's going to be here for a long – as long as he's at Florida State, you feel like they're going to be successful. And, again, with Harbaugh leaving and Saban leaving, um, yeah, I don't think it's outlandish to think that Norvell, it, other than Kirby, none of those guys are absolute – like Brian Kelly is probably the most um, bankable of those guys, right? Like where you'd say you know he can coach at a, coach well at a high level. He's done it now for fifteen years, right? Ten to twelve years. Brian Kelly. Yeah, yeah. He's more. Pro- he's as proven as all. He doesn't have the championships, but he's as proven as all those guys are. He won at LSU. He won at Notre Dame. He won at Cincinnati. Uh, he he's done really well. He's a very good coach. He's more proven than Mike Norvell. But again, I don't know that LSU would be like. No, 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 no. We don't want Mike Norvell. We want to keep Brian Kelly. I, I man, I'm telling you, I think that just that's a good place to be, man. Where I and people know I'm kind of a rational, realist guy. You say I'm too rational, and I don't. But like just sitting here talking about it, I don't know that other than Athens, Georgia, there is not a slam dunk case where one school likes their coach so much more than they would if they had Mike Norvell. He's that's how much he's accomplished in a short amount of time here. Plus, yeah. he was really good at Memphis, too, so yeah. that helps. Well, especially right now, too. I think, I think there are some Ohio State fans that are grumpy with Ryan Day. Right. After That's what I'm Irving. saying. Yeah. I, obviously, Ryan Day's at one more games, and he has a great, great program. But he took over a great program. And, they're, they're, yeah, they're not, they're not thrilled with how they play against Michigan, right? So, yes. again, they would not – if Ryan Day left tomorrow and Mike Norvell stepped in, they would not be upset, I don't think. I don't think any of those schools would. So I guess Lowe would report that, that Norvell was close to accepting the Alabama job. So by virtue of that, we double stamp Ira's reporting that Norvell was the, the odds-on favorite guy, or he was, the, he was the, uh, the first choice, I guess, maybe. Oh, he absolutely was. Ira, uh, and then also uh, when Feldman started, again, I, this goes back to when that was all happening in January. When Feldman started talking about how Norvell made perfect sense for Alabama and started tweeting all that, Feldman doesn't do that just in a – on a whim in a vacuum right? he's getting yeah. real information neither does Dellinger who yeah. wrote that uh back then like man they those guys are dialed in and mm-hmm. so that made that's when I got really nervous about Norvell was when Bruce Feldman started talking about how much sense it made for him to go to Tuscaloosa but guess what he ain't there he's not is he? nope. nope nope he's not he's not all right let me uh, talk about mybookie.ag real quick, Corey. I don't know what's going on here with uh, the Knowles, man, but mybookie.ag not showing proper respect, man. They keep dropping them down on the boards. But that just means if you bet on the Knowles and they win, uh, you get more money. Mybookie.ag, the promo code is WARCHANT. Use that when you sign for the first time. You get an instant cash deposit bonus. Uh, DJ has now slipped down to plus 3,300 to win the uh, the Heisman. Cam Ward plus 2,200, Corey. Um, and the Knowles... I mean, Clemson just moving up on our territory. They got Clemson also at plus 2,000 to win the whole darn thing. Tie with the Knowles. Somehow, Michigan and Ole Miss ahead of both Clemson and Florida State. Uh, I'm not that shocked about being ahead of Clemson, but I'm a little bit shocked that they're ahead of Florida State. Michigan's lost their whole coaching staff practically. Uh, Ole Miss, did you see You see what my guy Lane Kiffin did? Uh, he took... No. Uh, so Mississippi State fired their coach. Uh, he just hired him as an analyst. 
I did see that. Yes, of course he did. Yeah, <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it as much as uh, almost as much as free money. Uh, you'll get free money if you use that promo code WarChant. There are some stipulations, though, so I'll read them to you right now. The promo requires a $50 minimum deposit and a rollover requirement of one-time or deposit total, including bonus for withdrawal for full terms and conditions. Visit mybookie.ag slash about dash us. All right. Hey, let's talk some baseball. Knowles played last night. They won. 19 to 3 against Florida Gulf Coast. Let's talk about pitching, even though they scored 19 runs and uh, knocked out 18 hits. Connor Whitaker started a lot of back to back home runs to start the game. Not great. Come on, con man. But after that, four shutout innings. He went six innings on the night, three earned runs, nine strikeouts, only one walk. I don't think we're going to see a lot of him midweek once conference season rolls around. But for now, you're getting to see a really good display of just how valuable Connor Whitaker is going to be for the team moving forward um, because I think he's either going to be Sunday or he's going to be a long reliever uh, in these weekend series when it comes to ACC play and whomever else gets in Florida State's path between now and Omaha. Fingers crossed. Bullpen, we're always going to keep an eye on the bullpen. Hudson Rowan came in, one inning, three strikeouts. Hashtag efficiency. Uh, 15 total pitches, 10 of them were strikes. A good outing there by Hudson. And I want to talk real quick about Yoel Tejada uh, because he is the young man that started the other week, maybe against Western Carolina on a Sunday, and he threw 12 straight balls to start the game, uh, and they gave him the hook. They are just like, all right, you don't have it. And then we asked Link last week going into the Invitational in Greenville, like, you know, hey, what's the – do you still want to start him or how are you going to reintegrate him? Is he going to have to come back in the middle of a game so it's maybe not as much on his mind getting prepared? And he's like, yeah, I'd like to get some – separation they didn't get enough separation apparently in greenville but they had a huge lead against florida gulf coast i think at that point it was 16 to 3 when they brought tejada in he gets an out ground ball first base uh first batter he faces then he gets a 3-2 count after he was ahead and it's like oh man he's gonna walk the guy but no he gets another ground ball you're like sweet look at that piece of cake man two quick outs Uh, but then he issues a two out walk and then a single and you're like man Maybe this kid just isn't going to figure it out. And he's, you know, he's like six, seven uh, righty. He's special. I mean, the velocity that he can throw with is just, it's valuable. Uh, it was awesome. He gets a strikeout to get the inning over with. So that was good to see him bounce back. Had some stressful moment there. It was smooth sailing at first. Then he had some bumpiness, came right back, got the out to get out of the inning. So that was good to see from Yol Tejada. All right, let's talk about the offense. Yeah. They got over 150 hits now, I think, in 11 games. They've won all 11 games. Um, you know, you say, oh, do the math. I, I say that because I can't do the math, uh, but it's more than 10 hits a game. I know that. I know that for sure. Dion Ross, two for five, had a double, three runs and a stolen base. James Tibbs, three walks because he's scary to throw to. He's really scary to throw to. Jaime Ferrer had a grand slam in the fifth inning, which blew this thing open because, again, Florida Gulf Coast struck first with back-to-back home runs. Florida was able to scratch a run across in the bottom half of the inning, and you're like, all right, game on. Let's go. Uh, Marco Dinges, two for four, four ribbies and a jack. Alex Lodis, watch out. Our guy from UNF might be finally starting to cook now. He's batting above 300 now after, I think, being below 200 heading into last weekend. Uh, he was three for five, had two RBIs, also hit a home run, one of four on the night for Florida State. And then Cam Smith, and I don't, don't want to put any voodoo on the kid. Don't want to do that at all. Man, he'll probably have a bad weekend at some point. But I think after that, he'll be all right. Not saying he's just going to have one, but I I just don't see like seven bad days for this kid. You know, I don't see him having a bad midweek, a bad weekend series, and then another bad midweek performance. He's just that smooth right now. He's just that dialed in. Uh, Three for four, two RBIs, as well as a home run. And when we spoke to Link afterwards, and by we, I mean Ira Schofel, shout out to our guy Ira out the game covering it you know, pretty much gave you the closest thing to, I don't know, just kind of the way that Norvell almost would talk about the team at, at, you know, early in the season last year, just about like, hey, like we just, or maybe Atkins more so than than Mike, about it's like, listen, man, we just got guys. Like, you know, Jordan gets us in the right play. Trey's a load to bring down. Johnny blocks crazy, catches the ball. Key, you know, just basically we have the talent. That's why we're performing the way we're performing. And Link was pretty much, he's like, it's the lineup. He's like, it's just, it's so balanced. You know, they start off righty, lefty, righty, lefty. I think when they go with Diamez and then they go to Cam Smith and then it's Tibbs and then it's Ferrer. Um, 
And listen, like Faro didn't even speak about him. He was one for four. Uh, that's fine because he got picked up by everybody in front of him and behind him too because Lodi's had a great night. Um, again, it just feels like they are a legitimately talented offensive team. Link has them relaxed. Link has them looking for the pitches they want, the pitches they're comfortable with, which I know that's like basic, but to be able to put them in the right frame of mind so that they're able to perform, that's the most you can do right at this point in a coach's job at this level. So he continues to do it for the offense. And listen, we'll see when they start playing some better teams, obviously. You know, this Gulf Coast team was not a not a great team by any stretch, but they came out to play, and then Florida State got you know maybe punched first. But then Florida State absolutely clobbered them. Again, 19-3 win over Florida Gulf Coast. 18 hits. Next up for Florida State, they'll face Uno. Not Nebraska-Omaha, but New Orleans. Uh, they're currently playing, I think, South Alabama, and they're up. So they'll probably be 8-4 and four when they come to Tallahassee. They're actually in Mobile playing the game on Wednesday night. Uh, that was their first actual like road game outside city limits of New Orleans. They played Tulane as well, but uh, Uno comes to town. And then after that, Florida State will have a midweek against Florida in Gainesville, and then Notre Dame, who currently is nine and two, uh, they'll take on Virginia Tech this weekend as well. So they're eleven and zero. Florida State best start, building on what they had in twenty nineteen, and twenty nineteen they went to Omaha. So take that for what it's worth. Back to regular scheduled program with Corey and myself. I'm sure you told your wife you'd only be an hour. It's been a little bit over an hour or so. Uh, she's sleeping. She had a rough night last night. So she's sleeping. We're all good. Is there any gaming out there in Nashville? Uh, no, but apps work. Okay, that's right. So we got we got that going for us. Apps work. I don't think there are any casinos, at least none that we know about. But there's a lot of honky-tonks, Aslan. Mm. Broadway. Have you, guys been honky -tonks. Have you been on Broadway yet? Of course we were, yeah. Okay. Uh, heard a little Morgan Wallen. Okay. And when I say a little, I mean a lot. Heard a lot of Morgan Wallen on uh, on Tuesday night, and I'm sure we'll hear some more tonight. Okay. All right. Well, have fun out there. That was our first roadie together. Remember that big dog, 2018? Uh, you know, I was telling uh, Stephanie that. She's like, you and Aslan were here? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. It's like it was the first time we'd gone on a trip, and then for some, I was like, he left in the middle of it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, he broke like a piece of video equipment or something, yeah. right? Didn't he break some of the camera? And broke instead of staying, you just left. I didn't have the proper like tripod um, sl uh, slider to, to put onto the act from the camera to connect to the tripod. So I just set it on the tripod and we were recording and it fell off like onto the concrete yeah. concourse yeah. inside Bridgestone Arena. And I remember I, I had texted or I, I messaged Gene. I was like, hey, I'm like, camera doesn't work, but I can film some stuff on my camera. And he was like, you just come back. And I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm gonna get fired already. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. That was. Yeah. So for the people here. that don't remember, and why would you? That was the year that Florida State uh, upset Xavier yep. in the second round. Xavier was the one seed, and Florida State beat them to go to the Sweet 16, where they then beat Gonzaga and got to the Elite Eight, where they lost to Michigan. Yeah. But yeah, I was reliving all that, man. That was a fun. That was a fun trip. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to we'll get to cover this basketball team in an NCAA tournament again soon, like next year. Yeah. Let's Me make it happen. Remember who they beat in the uh, first game? Missouri with a. Uh, the kid that's in, uh, with the Nuggets now, Porter. Michael Porter, yeah. Uh, was like, that was like, maybe the, might have been the first game he played all year because he was battling a back injury. The first game he played and, in forever. And you could tell. <laughs> he was not good. They were not good. Uh, Florida State kind of rolled them. But, yeah, man, that was a, that was a fun – that was a Friday night. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we went out afterwards, and then you mm -hmm. left on Saturday. That's and uh, I, was, I was here by myself. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a wrap for us. We're not done for the week here on the program, though. Ira's going to jump on. And we'll have a Friday program wrapping up all, all of our observations from Tour of Duty. If you don't want to wait for the podcast to drop, go to warchant.com. There'll be video, observations, interviews with Coach Storms and Coach Norvell, photographs, the whole nine, tweets, all of it. We got you covered. Warchant.com on social media and warchant.com, your ultimate semi sports source. For Corey, I'm Aslan. Thanks for listening to Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Barn Grill. <laughs>